you've got to realize that whatever you're doing, you're competing with somebody. What is it that gives you an advantage over your competition? Whatever you're good at, try to be great at it. And if you're great at it, good things will happen. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. This is the Maverick Podcast. I'm your host, DJ Maverick. Before we get started, I want to tell everybody, please be sure to subscribe. We've got like 99% of you guys that aren't subscribed. We see the views coming back, so just subscribe. All the cool kids are subscribed. Today, we have another cool episode for you guys. We have entrepreneur Dr. Bianca Flores. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Before we dive in, maybe for the 1% of the people out there that don't know who you are, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Dr. Bianca Flores. You can call me Bianca. Okay. I have my PhD in neuroscience and I live here in Oklahoma City and I'm a local entrepreneur here. Awesome. Repping in Iowa, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm originally from Iowa. That's Tell me right. about that. What was that like? <laughs> I was cold. Um, but, you know, um, I grew up in Iowa. I was born and raised there. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of corn. A lot of flatness, yeah. but um, for about a year in high school, I actually lived in Las Vegas. Really? Yeah. Okay. For my sophomore year. In high I've school. never like met somebody that actually <laughs> lives in Vegas. Everybody goes to Vegas right. to party, yeah. but never <laughs> live. What's it like to live there? I mean, it's totally different. I bet. It's totally different. I mean, yeah. it was. I mean, I was a teenager, right? So yeah. it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, oddly enough, I went to this prep school that I got a scholarship to. Okay. So I was kind of surrounded by a lot of kids who were incredibly wealthy, but like wow. you know, my parents couldn't afford that. Yeah. So I, I had a scholarship, which was really awesome, but um, it was hard. So it not was, on the strip, like every no, week no. <laughs> you had like a different Vegas no, experience. No, definitely. Right? It had a yeah. huge, yeah, it was hugely yeah. different. Um, it was in Summerland. So like I was very far out from okay. the strip, but you know, I think a lot of people would find it surprising that Las Vegas actually has a lot of like nature to offer. So like Red no Rocks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, that area is really fantastic. Um, and it was just, I don't know. I just remember studying all the time and then yeah. we would go have like our prom or our homecoming at like the casinos. Wow. That's <laughs> cool. I bet it was like legit, right? Like full oh, yeah. on. Like that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It was definitely entertaining. Cool. And then did you go back to Iowa or yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. So that was actually around the, um, 2008 economic crisis. Okay. And so my mom, um, you know, she lost her job and so we moved back and luckily we still had a home there. And so, um, from there, you know, I finished up high school. I did IB, if anybody awesome. is familiar with that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and that sort of kind of like opened up my, um, sort of my worldview. Um, how did you sort of get focused into science? How did that come about? Yeah, so, I don't know, probably a morbid fascination from when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so, un unfortunately, um, in my family, I have like a lot of great aunts who had Alzheimer's or dementia and I remember kind of being around them as a kid when we would go visit and mm -hmm. so I was just kind of always curious about how the mind worked and sort of how everybody was connected and sure. um, really how they they function later on in life and um, my grandmother who's the youngest of a lot of kids like 13 14 oh, wow. <laughs> she's one of those <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah but her sisters were much older yeah and some who were a few years older they seemed to decline a lot faster mm -hmm. um, than you know, than other family members and my grandma, you know, for now, luckily she's in good health, but I was just always curious of what really determined that yeah. and what sort of like, you know, genetic factors, environmental factors really influenced that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that kind of jump started my curiosity and in, in Iowa, luckily at the time there were a lot of like summer science camps, like for middle schoolers. Okay, cool. So I, I did those. So that was always a good time. Awesome. Yeah. And then you got into neuroscience, yeah. right? So right. where did you go to pursue that? Yeah, so I um, I did my bachelor's at the University of Rochester, where okay. I did neuroscience. Um, and then afterwards, I did my PhD at Vanderbilt, and I did a postdoctoral fellowship, which is like additional research training at Johns Hopkins. Awesome. That's very cool. We we're just talking <laughs> off camera how much you love Rochester winters, <laughs> yeah. and the school has like a tunnel system, <laughs> yeah. right? Tell me about yeah. that. What was that like? Um... Um, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta take a deep breath. Like, yeah, I have to take a deep breath. Just <laughs> the <so you> memories. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. It was just so cold. I remember, um, like everything just freezing. Yeah. I also remember this like one awful time, my senior year of college. My room was like. 
20 degrees colder than the re- like everywhere else in the building. Mm-hmm. And finally, like I just because I was always in the library studying. Finally, I was like, I can't take it anymore. And I called, you know, like staff services to come help. And they're like, oh, actually, your window is open just like a centimeter. And that's why your room was 20 degrees. Really? <laughs> that's so crazy. It was, yeah, it was cold. Yeah, it gets cold here, but not we need tunnels. Yeah, cold. Not like yeah. too close to Canada. Rochester. Yeah. Cold. What was that college experience, you know, for you? Was, it, was there a lot of like people that you could identify with, you know, or was it diverse? What was it like there? Yeah, um, it was actually quite tough. Yeah. Um, so I'm the youngest of four, um, but I'm, you know, first generation college student, um, you know, American. My dad's from Mexico. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I was probably, no, I was the only one of my siblings who went out of the state to pursue okay. their education. Were they like trying to convince you not to go? Like, hey, stay here local? Yeah, or actually, were they like, yeah. you know, and in hindsight, you know, maybe it would have been better had I listened to them. I feel like when I listen to my older siblings, it, things kind of go a little bit smoother, but you know, yeah. <laughs> that's how the, yeah. the baby of the family goes. But, um, yeah, so everybody tried to convince me to kind of like stay in Iowa. Um, you know, we, we thought maybe there was going to be a longer term, you know, mm. uh, plan there, but I was like, no, 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 I, I need to go to Rochester. I need to do this because while I was doing IB, yeah. we had this research class called um, theory of knowledge and so basically just kind of write about any topic and I got really excited about this topic called psychoneuroimmunology okay. or PNI so basically like how the mind affects the body and so you know back then it was sort of like almost um, ridiculous to think that you know your thoughts could affect your body or your immune system could affect your brain mm-hmm. um, but now of course there's a lot of science that backs that up Definitely. And so one of the the person who coined that term actually was in in Rochester. He's a researcher at Rochester. So that's what drew me there because I thought I wanted to pursue research with him. And then the year that I got there is the year he retired. Oh, man. (laughs) I know. I just, yeah. So that's kind of how you decided to go (laughs) to Rochester based on that? Based on that. Cool. That's a, so that's a good segue. What are your thoughts on Neuralink? Because I think that's super (laughs) interesting, right? What are your thoughts on that? Um... I think there needs to be a lot more transparency yeah. with that and what's going on, especially because, um, you know, throughout my graduate school studies and even, you know, throughout, you know, being a scientist, being trained as a scientist, number one, you need to make sure that your research sub- subjects are okay, whether they're animals or they're humans. And I don't have enough confidence in their research process yeah. to determine whether or not that's actually true. Okay. And so I'm not saying that that's impossible. I sure. think it's a cool tech. I think there's yeah. a lot of possibility with that. But I'm not sure if that's necessarily the way that it's going to go. You know, of course, when you look at nerve stimulation devices, there's a bunch of different, um, you know, things that can happen or things that exist. Um, But I'm not sure if I would go all in. Yeah, I just think some of the use cases for it, right? Like, uh, you know, if if you're physical, uh, you know, you can't control it because of your nervous system. Neuralink sort of provides maybe a gateway for that to be solved, right? So it's interesting to think about, right? That's that's definitely real. And there are like current, you know, um, devices on the market too, where it's not necessarily focused on your brain, but, you know, through throughout the rest of your spinal cord. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd be curious, you know, how it tests up against, you know, current market standards. But I think we have a little bit more to go on that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm just curious, especially how it's going to work out with the rest of his investments and how Neuralink might be affected. If if you ask Elon, it's like, it's coming next (laughs) week. Everybody has Neuralink next week, (laughs) right? right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I I think it's a cool, cool tech. You know, lots of opportunity. Anytime that you could like, you know, benefit society, I think it's worth exploring exploring oh for but, sure but to your point it does need to be solid data to back that up yeah right? yeah, yeah. I, I would like to see more data and i would like to see more transparency yeah so. so you went through college you focused on that and then did you pursue a career in that like what did you do after yeah um so directly after college i actually uh, went to vanderbilt to pursue my phd in neuroscience okay and so um i spent about five and a half years <laughs> there awesome. a long time yeah <laughs> But it was, you know, it wasn't a, it, I would say it's, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. the best and the worst of times. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was good. I focused more on molecular neuroscience. I um, worked with an animal model that focused on neuropathy, okay. which is basically like, you know, when your hands get kind of tingly because you've been like sitting on them or, yeah, yeah it's basically like that, but the genetic form of that. Okay. So yeah. So I spent um, uh, about five and a half years doing that and then I graduated right as the pandemic started so. i see wow yeah that's really cool because uh, you know you probably being in that space 
there probably wasn't a lot of Hispanics in that space, right? Yeah, Tell me right. a little bit about that. What was that experience like? Yeah, so um, before I even started graduate school, kind of like winding back to Rochester, um, I felt incredibly isolated, incredibly lonely. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, Rochester was so far away from, you know, so many things I was familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and so there it was really important to find like a good friend group, a good study group, just good community overall. And I had a really tough time with the system structure for resources that they supposedly provided for, you know, first gen students or students of color, et cetera. Okay. Um, their message didn't necessarily align with their action. And so when I chose for, you know, where I wanted to do my PhD, I basically told myself, like, look, this is a hard program. Um, you want to go somewhere where you're supported. And mm -hmm. if that's not the case, like, don't don't even entertain it. Yeah. And luckily, the only only grad school actually that I got accepted to happened to be a place where it okay. looked like they supported people. How would you yeah. sort of research that ahead of time? Right. Because yeah. they, could, they could present something really cool on the mm -hmm. website, through marketing, social media. Mm -hmm. But then you get there and it might be a different story. Right. Oh, that's so true. Yeah. Um, number one, talk to the students. Students okay. don't lie, especially true. when they're grumpy. They're yeah. not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there like a glass door for like schools? <laughs> no. Yeah. You know what? Insanely enough for anybody who is looking to graduate mm -hmm. school, you can just email students. Okay. They'll often have like, you know, designated students that you can email and connect with. But for example, even in the scientific realm, if you're looking for at specific lab spaces or you're really interested in a specific researcher, don't be afraid to ask the boss like, hey, can you connect me with a few of your students? OK, that's, and that, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's cool, because if you get direct feedback from them, mm -hmm. they can give you the actual feedback of, hey, this is what it's really like here. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I liked that a lot of the students seemed really happy there and specific, like especially the students of color seemed yeah. happy there. So to me, I mean, as happy as you could be doing a PhD program, right? Sure. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I liked that there was like specific NIH funding, so National Institutes of Health, so government funding that was funneled into supporting these students um, yeah. in their first years of research and um, really dedicated to forming the community. And, you know, two of the you know major deans there um, had like a background in, in supporting students. So. Cool. Throughout your research, were you a fan of like data and sort of like applying computers and models to the data? Do you geek out about that stuff or do you want to be more hands on with the, with the stuff you're doing? Well, so it's a bit of a mix yeah. um, for, you know, so throughout my research, I was very, you know, wet lab or hands on, as they call it. So I worked mm -hmm. with, you know, animals or I would work with actually doing experiments. I didn't necessarily run any code for anything. OK, um, but I always enjoyed getting the data back and trying to analyze it and figure it out. So, you know, doing different statistical models yeah. um, and trying to understand what was significant and what wasn't significant. Like, could I publish? Could I graduate? <laughs> right. No, because I think that's another sort of interesting space now with AI. Yeah. You can just throw chunks of data oh, at yes. it and it just analyzes and gives you the feedback almost instant. Right. So I, I love. Yeah, yeah, I love. What are your thoughts of like leveraging AI to maybe potentially solve some of these diseases that never had cures? Right. Well, I'm not sure if I believe that it can like directly solve a disease, but what I do think it can do really well is streamline the process. Yeah. So, you know, it's based on everything that we feed it. Right. And so um, even just the other day, I was playing with ChatGPT and I saw that there's a really cool function where, uh, you know, you can have a PDF and it'll you can ask it a bunch of questions and it'll feed out these answers to you. Yep. So that could save you like hours of research and work and help you figure out like okay these are the top papers in my field these are sort of the subjects i need to be focusing on this would yeah. be make, make a really next great paper or this would make a really good research topic to send in for funding to then support my lab research efforts right definitely so i think it more than anything it can help streamline the process for now for now mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> I, I just think it's interesting if, if you do ai and then machine learning on top of that oh yeah like you could just get like amazing data clean data mm -hmm. and you know, almost instantaneously find the trends, find, you know, maybe like key takeaways mm -hmm. really quickly versus like just being in a spreadsheet all day or something, yeah. just manually yeah. doing it. Right. Yeah, that's so true. And yeah. there's obviously like a lot of really good machine learning models right now that focus on like drug targets and yeah. analyzing, you know, different protein structures and, and, you know, what might be a best option for that. So. Yeah. Was there ever another like plan B or was it always like science? I'm all in and science. <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I don't think so. I was always really interested in science. Um, I wasn't necessarily sure what I was going to do with it. You know, for the longest time, I, when you first kind of get into undergrad, at least when I first got there, especially 
Rochester being a pretty heavy STEM school, mm-hmm. I thought like, oh yeah, I want to be an MD, right? But I said that with that, and think the thought that without really knowing what that whole process was, yeah, and really what it entailed, and then you know, shadowing um, MDs like at the school and understanding that like this is not what I want to do at all. <laughs> so, what would be the career path if you were to pursue that? Be a neuroscience. Would you be like a brain surgeon or like what, what would be the, the I space? Mean, there's a couple different yeah. you know avenues you could go. You could be a neurologist. You could you could be a brain surgeon. I always yeah. had butterfingers, though. Okay. I knew surgery was <laughs> yeah. not my route. No. OK. <laughs> but you're not like freaked out with like blood and all that. No, like, yeah. I mean, I, I don't enjoy it, yeah. but it never really freaked me out. And I knew that I had to kind of get used to it, especially if going the research route, kind of sure. handling animals. Um, and understanding that like they were sacrificing their lives for yeah. the topic and having to deal with that. All right. So tell me, how did you land in Oklahoma? I haven't been able to connect <laughs> the dots. How did you make it here? Um, so my sister was actually living here in Oklahoma City for a few years. Uh, my dad actually lives here as well. Cool. And so um, my sister is a truck driver and my dad is as well. So I come from a family of truck drivers. Awesome. And so um, she just bought a new house on the south side and for my day job, I work remotely. Okay. I have three dogs. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And so it just kind of made sense for me to to move in with her. Yeah. Um, you know, if she wasn't going to be home very often and, and you know, me with all my dogs. Yeah. I was, there you, was always somebody there. Had you visited previously? Like you've been to Oklahoma. <laughs> had, so you kind of knew the vibe and what to expect. And Well, you know, actually uh, I didn't because I had visited in the wintertime. Oh, uh, okay. I feel like it's a completely it's different drastic. city in the wintertime. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't a huge fan. No? But <laughs> then I came in the summer and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. It's like a really happening city. So yeah. um, it just sort of made sense. And I never left. <laughs> what would you say is like maybe the, the most like drastic changes between Iowa and Oklahoma? Like what what is some, some of the stuff that you have to adjust basically? Um, well, that's hard to say because I actually haven't been, to, you know, to Iowa since like high school. True. And yeah. I, you know, from Oklahoma City, I had moved from San Antonio. I was living in San Antonio. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, if anything, I... I think it's actually surprisingly really diverse here. Yeah. And I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I think a lot of people ways. think the Oklahoma mm-hmm. Cowboys or something, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> Horses, right? It's always like the yeah. pass through state or the flyover yeah. state. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. So then we started being an entrepreneur. <laughs> and how did that come about? Just kind of brainstorming? Or was it because, you know, maybe the, the need that you were trying to like fulfill, you were like, hey, I, I'm not finding people like me. Mm-hmm. You know, making connections is a little bit tough. How did that come about? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it probably been brewing for some time. Like I mentioned, um, uh, doing a, a PhD or like, you know, going to undergrad where you're not too familiar with it, it can actually be quite isolating. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, aside from just like the time and effort that's spent into going to, and doing research, um, you're also just like isolated from your community. Even though you might have friends in graduate school, you don't always get to see them all the time, right. you know. And so it was just so isolating and it was so, you know, work focused at least for me it was Mm -hmm. and of course you know every everybody has a different experience but that's generally kind of the impression of the phd and so um while i was at vanderbilt though they had like i said they had a really good program and system for supporting students so um there was sacnes which is the society for the advancements of chicanos and native americans and hispanics in science okay um and there was also um the nih initiative for you know at the time it was called um, initiative for maximizing student diversity, but um, essentially it just focused on connecting, you know, first generation students and as well students of color, and really just trying to promote community within that specific academic ecosystem. Yeah. And so, I mean, Sacnus was like amazing. If anybody's ever been to Sacnus, I don't know. Have you ever been to Sacnus? No. Okay. I need to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's a conference that happens every year, and it's like absolutely beautiful because you know it's obviously very much like culturally focused, but as well, there's a lot of the scientific advancements and stuff that happen that they discuss. But um, where is it typically held? It'll be held in a different city every year. Okay. And so it's just beautiful because normally they will acknowledge like whose ever land we're on at the time, and it'll have like a beautiful. Um, opening ceremony but basically it just kind of made me remember like oh like this is what I'm missing yeah, like I'm missing sure. that community feel I'm missing sort of that connectedness that rootedness like that's what I'm missing yeah and that's kind of what like took me out of the sort of isolated headspace I was in okay and that reminds me of your question I always see you like what does community mean to oh, you yeah. right <laughs> yeah. yeah so you kind of discovered the power of community through yeah. these groups and stuff like that yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. and you know of course 
you know, connecting with my friends. And of course that, that was, you know, sustainable and it, mm-hmm. it carried on to um, my postdoc. And when I went and did my postdoc, I connected with like other friends from Sackness that I had met or other friends from Vanderbilt who ended up out on the East coast. Cool. Um, and so again, it was just sort of like a reminder, like I need to reach out to my community. I need to be connected and involved in my community. Um, and that's kind of how this sort of idea came I think, like I said, it had been percolating for yeah, some time. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until like really recently, until like this past year, where I had been talking to one of my friends who I did my PhD with. Mm-hmm. She was just like so upset and complaining. I'm like, you know what? Like, why can't we find other people that are sort of like us in the sense of they have similar like career, educational goals and like, similar cultural background? Like, why yeah. is it so hard? We know we exist, but why is it so hard to find somebody like that, like romantically? Yeah. And then I just kind of took off with it and I realized that like, it's not just sort of the dating and romantic partner connection. It's a much bigger need. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I wonder if it's because, you know, we try so hard to assimilate and fit in. And maybe that's why we're not as vocal about our background sometimes. Maybe I don't know if, if you mm-hmm. think that that's maybe a reason why you don't think we're out there. But there's definitely a lot of people out there. Well, I, right? I mean, I know we're out there. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we're, we're here. Out, yeah. right? We're, we we're just here. need to be more vocal, I think. Right? Well, I don't know. At this point, I think... And of course, it depends on what city you live in. Like Oklahoma City is just so unique and different to me because Mm -hmm. I feel like it's so easy to meet different people from different backgrounds. And it's so easy to just meet people when you go out. Whereas like, you know, when I was living in Baltimore for my postdoc or even living in Nashville, which is a very touristy city, it's kind it was a little bit harder to make those sustainable long term connections to sort of find that community. And so I think. you know, obviously my perspective is I think there needs to be more integrated platform yeah. where you can find these sort of community events that are happening or connect and network with people who maybe aren't of the same profession, but maybe like two to three degrees separate from you and still kind of create that tight knit community. Yeah. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah, what does community mean to you? Yeah. yeah. Well, to me, it's not anything physical. It's a feeling. It's like, okay. like I said, a feeling of rootedness. It feels like warmth throughout my body mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the feeling I get yeah but really you know in the physical the physical manifestation of it is you know I'm able to sort of go out to anywhere and see familiar unfamiliar faces that welcome me that are excited to see me yeah and you know people who look like me would you include music and food oh yeah and all traditions all, that. all that's part <laughs> of it right yeah, yeah it's definitely part of it yeah. so tell me about your idea it's corazón sazón mm, yeah. right so tell me about the idea what is it that you plan to do yeah yeah so um right now we are working on gaining customer traction mm-hmm. but the whole goal like i said at its core i know i sound like a broken record but it's, yeah. a, it's about creating community and so there are three main components to it. So the first, like I mentioned earlier, is dating. Of course, I know there's a ton of dating apps. I know dating is really, really tough. Yeah. But it's going to be a little different. Like I said, we're going to go beyond the swipe to create community. And so it's focused on these live person events. So we're going to be hosting live person events specifically at these local businesses. So it's more of a call to action cool. where we bring people into um, your neighborhood business or your neighborhood venue to like understand where we're putting our dollars and promote again promote that community so yeah. you maybe don't feel as uncomfortable right so you don't want the connection to happen within the app you want the connection to happen in person yeah, yeah. ideally and of course you know i i don't want to assume your age but do you remember when social you know social media first kind of came about and it was For like sure. oh it's going to connect us it's going to make us feel more together yeah. but really it's it's isolated us more and digitalized everything yeah. not that it's a bad thing like it has its pros and cons i'm not mm. saying get rid of social media obviously <laughs> but <laughs> yeah but um you know i am trying to kind of get back to those roots those efforts and then the second p- component is having this group networking where like i mentioned it's not you know linkedin's great it's fantastic but it's more individualized i want to focus more on sort of the group like what is going on in your life your profession where you know, maybe you are a photographer, but it might be helpful to know a podcaster, a yeah. web designer, a lawyer, et cetera. So again, thinking about those connections two to three, four degrees out. Cool. And even like supporting and one another, like right. if you got an event or something exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly right? that. And then yeah. the third component, like I said, is is really community focused. So mm-hmm. there's going to be this search function where you can look and see whatever local businesses um, around you are um, owned, you know, by the Latin community. So if you want to go to a specific, you know, Peruvian, Mexican, whatever, a burger joint, and yeah. you want to know, you know, who owns it, if it's, you know, Latino owned, you can check cool. that out. And of course, the additional component to it is, you know, they're going to be businesses who might 
maybe not be owned by Latinos, but maybe they offer these specific products mm -hmm. and they're going to be highlighted as well. So awesome. Why Corazón Sazón? I mean, it rhymes, it's <laughs> it catchy, rhymes. but why Corazón Sazón? It just came to me yeah. one day. It just okay. came to me. And so it just kind of, it sounded right. And it felt like, oh yeah. Like when I was very much focused on the dating component, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I, like I say, I tell, I tell everybody in English, it very much loosely translates to like, you know, seasoned heart, spicy yeah. heart, right? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but really, I think it kind of captures the essence of our community. We're vibrant, we're joyful. Mm -hmm. When you go to our events, you know, even um, any sort of like restaurant, anything, I, I guess when I think about our community, I think about like a lot of joy, a lot of happiness, a Definitely. lot of vibrancy. Yeah, and I don't know if it's your official logo or not, but I always see an orange, right? Yes, yeah. La media naranja, right? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like what the meaning behind that or what? Yeah, no, yeah. that's exactly right. So, you know, in Spanish, it's the same, media naranja, which is like your your other half. Mm -hmm. And so I think it expands to more than just like a one-on-one -on -one connection, but yeah. you, you know, you're like an orange on the branch of your tree of your community, right? You are trying to go beyond and connect, not just with romantic partnerships, but with friendships, with group networking, with your community at the end of the day and again i just i love oranges <laughs> yeah no, that's cool <laughs> and so I, yeah. let's say elevator pitch i put you mm. on the spot what makes you different than somebody like tinder mm. right is it that you're bringing sort of the community aspect professional and then also romantic perhaps are you, are you making all those connections what makes you different uh i would say our you know competitive edge is that we're community focused okay and so in the sense of you know you can have the opportunity to, to be in a group together as opposed to sort of that one-on-one -on -one connection. And you don't always you know, know necessarily if it's gonna work sure. out or not, right? Yeah. But it also kind of pushes people and self-selects for people who wanna do that regardless. Okay. And I think that's, again, that's the difference. That's a competitive edge. It brings people back, or excuse me, out from where they were and back into the community yeah. where I think a lot of cool ideas happen. I'm already kind of geeking out with yeah. the data potentially. Oh, oh right? my God, don't Cause, even go start yet. Yeah. <laughs> because if you can tell like, hey, they like yeah, to yeah. eat at these these places. Yes, yes. They like this music. They mm -hmm. go to like these concerts. Yes. Like, so, you know, have you thought about oh all that data? I think about that all the time. Yeah. Um, well, even just like uh, if you, because like another thing I've been thinking about, like is there a way, well, of course, there's always a way, right? But I just need the technical know-how. Yeah. Like perhaps there could be a way where we, put like everybody like as an orange right and like you can look on a map and see like where are we all tonight oh, what's happening that's definitely possible right yeah. like what's happening tonight like where where is the event tonight who like oh. what's happening and then yeah basically drawing the lines and connections from there like these group of people and of course like you know there's going to be an algorithm development yeah. i need to focus on that and i'm i'm i've been thinking a lot about that right like mm -hmm. for people who value xyz what are the best groups to match them with and yeah. what what is that going to look like when they show up in their community so yeah i'm already thinking about that right because yeah. if she doesn't like my nah, <laughs> not not it's gonna that's a red flag it's right? not gonna work out it's not gonna work out maybe she should yeah. be one of the questions yeah so you're kind of like already doing like some community stuff going yeah. to events i've seen you do some interviews stuff like yeah. that so you're putting yourself out there does that take a lot of guts to do that or does that come natural to you um well you know what Oddly enough, I, I spent the summer preparing for that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So over the summer, I was a... Uh, um one of the water taxi people. Oh, the no <laughs> way. You did that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Okay. But you're, you're, you're coming from like San Antonio, the real <laughs> river walk, right? And then are you comparing our river walk well, to... Well, so fun fact, yeah. we did consult those engineers yeah. when we built out the canal. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so their number one piece of advice was to make sure that the canal wasn't connected to any natural water resource. Okay. Because I don't know if you've noticed the water in Bricktown, it's a, it's a darker shade of green. Yeah. Which prevents algae growth that will happen. In so that's that. a good thing? <laughs> because um, it looks some, I mean, sometimes it, it looks prevents a little algae bad. growth yeah. it's just more like if you you can treat the water mm. but the water the water's contained yeah i just know at the end of the year they usually do like a cleanup and yeah. the amount of bird scooters <laughs> and everything random that they pull out of that thing yeah. it's crazy wheelchairs yeah. like i just know like what's the story behind that well, like somebody like <laughs> fell out the wheelchair they yeah. just like screw it they walked away <laughs> like how does that happen I have yeah. no idea, but would you like to know the number one item they found the last time they cleaned it out? Absolutely. Do you, you don't want to guess? Uh, well, I would think the scooters, because a lot of okay. drunk people ride in the scooters. Other than that, I would say probably bottles, stuff like that. No? 
<laughs> no. Really? So the number one thing, the last time they cleaned it out, because they clean it out every like four to five years. Yeah. Next clean. Oh, it, I thought it was like every year. No, four that, maybe that's San Antonio. Years? I think oh, it's San wow. Antonio, because that's okay. probably because it's connected to the yeah, San Antonio River. Yeah. It's a little different. But they actually, the last time they cleaned it out, they found single pairs of women's high heel shoes. Really? <laughs> that's like the number one? <laughs> that's I the number could one. see that if you're on the yeah. edge. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> what happened to the other yeah. shoe? Yeah, they just like they just leave, right? Just yeah. hobble back to the Uber in one shoe. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> so you, you sort of did that to prepare. You just yes. like I'm going to do this, right? Yeah. So I yeah I did that over the summer, um, because I'm going to be honest. I kind of lost a little bit of my social skill, like just with my remote job and yeah. sort of with my background. Um, always researching. Yeah. Always in the library, probably. Right. 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 Yeah. Always in the lab, and you yeah. know I did try to like. I think for me personally as a scientist, like with my scientist training, I always try to make sure that whatever I'm talking about, whatever I'm explaining, like mm. anybody could understand whether it's a kindergartner or my grandmother. Yeah. Like I, explain it me, like I'm five, right? Well, to me, that's so important. And <laughs> yeah. if you can't explain it to the, like that, I don't think you understand your research. Mm. I will die on that hill. Yeah. But <laughs> um, so I was trying to kind of get back to sort of that headspace that I was kind of in graduate school where like I could just talk about anything yeah. and I would be comfortable talking to anybody, no matter their background, no matter what they look like, um, and just be comfortable with that. And being a, a water taxi tour guide definitely does that. So you were driving. I was the driving boat. the boat. I was driving yeah, the boat, giving nice. a little historical tour. And then you were like giving the tour and all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I spent my summer kind yeah. of learning that. It was a cool new skill, yeah. actually. You know, to drive a, a little boat. But what's the craziest story? Anybody fall off or? Oh, luckily no. <laughs> no. Luckily no. Not on my boats. No. Because I bet there's a lot of drunk people that decide well, to take a ride, right? This is true, but yeah. luck. I mean, so they've. So the person who owns Water Taxi actually, he used to be a boat driver. Okay. So he kind of already understands like sort of the pitfalls and the mm -hmm. good stuff that can happen. But they only the last boat on weekends we usually go around go out around eleven. Okay. And there's a curfew in Bricktown. And so yeah. it doesn't get too crazy. But like, you know, I would get flashed a handful of times, men and women. Really? Oh yeah. Okay. At Tipsy Tiki, just yeah. straight up. <laughs> nice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um cool beyond that luckily nothing like too major yeah and you kind of have to keep that conversation going throughout yeah, the whole exactly. sort of ride right right and yeah. I, I have to i mean in a way it's a pitch right so mm -hmm. there is the historical component but there's also like the showcasing of oklahoma city yeah right most people would be like oklahoma city what's beautiful about that and i could tell you a million things That's that awesome. are beautiful about that right yeah. so same thing kind of with like a, a pitch like What's cool about my app? What's different about my app? Right. You know, um, all cities have restaurants, but what's yeah. unique about our restaurants? Yeah. What's unique about our ice cream shops? And I bet there's stretches where there is nothing. Right? Oh, yeah. So then <laughs> what do you talk about in those long stretches where it's just like nothing? Well, yeah. I mean, like I said, everybody, every tour guide has their own little unique style. Yeah. But there would just be a stretch where I'd be like, okay, guys, I'm going to stop talking. Enjoy the silence. Nice. <laughs> enjoy the view, right? right. Enjoy yeah. the view. Enjoy the silence. Okay. No jokes? You wouldn't try to like try like jokes on along the way yeah or no? i mean yeah. i would try sometimes i would land sometimes yeah. i wouldn't um you know sort of the, just like the cheesy jokes because it is sort of it is touristy it's more like kind of family focused True. you yeah. can't be making like dirty <laughs> jokes yeah but <laughs> that's cool so you did your prep and then all of a sudden you're like okay i'm ready I'm just going to go to these events and just yeah. take my camera with me or how, <laughs> what was the idea there? Well, the idea conceptualized in like March, March, April. And I was like, oh, I need to get on this. And then I, I was like, this should have happened yesterday. Like, why doesn't an app like this exist? Mm -hmm. And then you kind of start to get into it, sort of like the headspace. It's like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I need to do more. Blah, blah, blah. Right. And so um, I just took the summer to just focus on that, work yeah. on that skill. And then once that ended, um, I had a plan to like apply for accelerators, just come up with the ideas, come up with the pitches and then, um, you know, start interviewing people because like really that's that's like a, an open journal pretty much on Instagram Definitely. and TikTok. Like you can watch the journey as it happens and it unfolds. And you can also like that's almost like a two and one. Right. You can still get it. Have your ear on the community and see yeah. what they're hearing. See and what it they validates want. your idea. Right. Because you're asking yeah. everybody what's community mean to you. Right. Right. And then you get to hear all these perspectives. That's mm -hmm. like more data. Ex exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, my yeah. ulterior motives. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> So you just go to random spots or how do you decide what, what, what yeah. events to go to? Um, so I just kind of like look on Instagram, see what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, 
I also like if I have like a friend of a friend that I know, I'm like, hey, I'm doing this thing. Like, mm -hmm. do you want to do this? Um, a good spot that I went to like in the beginning, Resident Head, they're fantastic. Um, I was going to do my live event there, but unfortunately we had to cancel it. We're going to recoup back into the okay. springtime. But anyway, cool. so Resident Head, um, like I said, I'll look on Instagram and see if there's any specific like Latin focused events. Mm -hmm. um, Gomez Western Wear was a big one. Oh, really? Yeah. OK, cool. Because <laughs> they had a huge opening. Yeah. And Is that where you were with the guy with the horse? Oh, yes. Is that where yeah. that came from? Yes, okay. that's where you came from. I didn't know where you were at. It was like <laughs> some random guy with the horse, and you were asking questions to the horse. Uh, yeah, too, I needed right? the horse's needed perspective, to know. too. It's another data point. Didn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. Yeah, so, yeah, just kind of try to keep my ear to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, that one I heard on the radio, so okay. I'm like, oh, maybe advertising on the radio still exists, because it was huge. It was really? ginormous. They had, you know... Um, the horses, they had the tacos, they had giveaways, they were giving away free boots, all this stuff. Yeah. So it was a cool community event. I love that they did that. Awesome. And they had music. So cool. Yeah. Are you pretty comfortable in Spanish and English? Or like you could do either or what? Yeah. yeah. So I do both, but I will say, you know, Spanish is my second language. So sometimes yeah. I have to like stop tripping over my words, take a breather, mm -hmm. and then like start over again. Because I, I would do tours in Spanish um, really? over the okay. summer. Sorry, Chad. But <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> We're cool. always allowed. So, like on the yeah. DL, you would do it in well, Spanish, or so what? So, like, I think it, uh, to his credit, right? There was sort of like this understanding, like if you have the skill, use it. But okay. we can't. It, it's hard to sort of like time it and actively sell like this. Yeah. In Spanish is going to be in English, um, but it worked out because it would just end up being a bilingual tour, and a okay. lot of the people who were English speakers were like, "Yeah, I understand it," or like, "This is cool. I love cool. that you did this." Right, and so that was that helped a lot. Yeah. Um, with like these Spanish interviews, right? Did you just do it based on like, you know, there's like X percentage of Spanish speaking people on board. No. I'm going to do it. Or is it like you just kind of just winged it or what? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, as if there was somebody who didn't know any English, like, and even if it was one person, like would I would do it. do it in Spanish. Okay. Right. But um, obviously like that was my limitation, right? I didn't yeah. know any German. I didn't know any French because we have sure. other, you know, tourists that come on there. Um, so I, I would do it because they would look so lost and confused. And I like, yeah. I can't just... I don't know. I just can't not do it. Mm -hmm. If I know, if I have the skill and if I know I can do it and I can yeah. help, I'm That's not awesome. going to sit back. Cool. Yeah. One of the questions I always ask my guests, if I pull up your playlist, who am I going to find <laughs> on your playlist? So I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. So right now I'm supporting Becky G a lot. Yeah. Okay. Do you <laughs> um, like her new stuff that she's doing more like regional Mexican cumbia? I, stuff I, like honestly, that? I think yeah. I've been waiting for her to do yeah. that. I think that's where her like gold is. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always been a Becky G stan. I'm a beaster. I've been following her yeah. from the beginning. <laughs> I love her. Awesome. But um, Becky G, Omar Apollo. Okay. Um, Deso Pluma. Nice. <laughs> All right. A lot of, uh, yeah, sort of like the popular. Hip cool. Hip -hop, yeah. What did you think about Shakira's new song? Because that it. one, I, I was it. like, that's not her vibe. Like, I get it. Like, and it also has a cool story. Like, you know, the background I don't. behind it. What so is the background? So it's basically based on, uh, I guess, her like the lady that helped around the house basically mm -hmm. that sort of found out that he was cheating on her and oh. like told her and then like he fired her. So this song, she basically wrote it based on that wow. and all the like streaming rights and proceeds are going to go to her Wait. and she like rehired her. So if you That's listen to the awesome. lyrics where it's like, el jefe viene, que quien sabe que, no nos trata bien. Oh. It's like goodness. written sort of like a jab to her ex. I it's gotta pretty go stream crazy. It now. Yeah. I have to go stream it. Yeah, I just don't like like the the vibe and I even don't. the dancing. I'm like, I, know. I don't know. It seems like everybody's trying to hop on to this like trend, which is cool, I guess. But I don't know. Sometimes I think you have to remain authentic to who you are. I agree. Yeah. I very much agree. And like, if you're not like a true, true artist, because I think there's like artists, I think there's performers, I think yeah. there are lyricists. Um, if that's like, if you're not a true artist and you don't have that kind of range, right. I think you should don't just force it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And so uh. like a lot of the regga reggaetoneros that will come and do, you know, corridos and stuff. It's like, yeah. I like, I love that you're doing that, but yeah. it, do, it just, you can tell it sounds a little <laughs> off. Yeah. The only one that's sort of been able to pull it off is Carol G. Oh yeah. With the, yeah. the, the cumbia about like mi ex tenia razón. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a cool, she pulled it off. Yeah. I think it, I well, like that one. I think Garo yeah. G has a lot of range. Yeah, so. definitely. Let's talk a little bit about sort of like crypto and blockchain. <laughs> So yeah. I, you're interested in that stuff? You yeah. experienced some oh, of that yeah. or what? Yeah. So um, I, w I will say I do believe it's in its infancy. Definitely. I'm, like, yeah. I love it. I'm not like a diehard diehard, but yeah. I dabble. Yeah. I definitely dabble. And I'm also like curious about all this new tech that's coming out with like mm -hmm. 
um, sort of like the social platforms or like using different blockchain technology yeah. to, to make these no, new social media websites. So right? I'll be decentralized and basically mm-hmm. it can't be shut down. Basically, right, right? Exactly. Yeah. Which I think is a cool concept, but of course it, I'm sure it has those disadvantages. <laughs> <Are you> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think so. I think the, the main thing is just the blockchain, the technology behind it all. Right. Yeah. Because I think that has a lot of potential, even with like normal records. Right. So mm-hmm. medical records, even maybe like the title to your car, Right. You know, a lot of like your resume mm-hmm. could be on the blockchain. Exactly. Right. And it's authenticated. It's up to date and it's standardized and you can share it. I don't right. know. I don't know what you think about right. that. Well, I mean, I think at its core, it's just like when I think about blockchain, like especially for a lay audience, what mm-hmm. they need to understand is that it's just protected, yep. that it's highly, highly secure and that it's protected. And, you know, they don't necessarily need to know like the theory of blockchain or all about all these different, you know, coins. Just know that it's just like another layer of security and protection. Now, where I think it's a problem or not necessarily a problem but it's more so like it's so slow to adapt and i do think it has a marketing problem in mm-hmm. the sense that the people that have adopted it are very they're just, young they're, they're <laughs> young but they're also their intensity and their um you know ferociousness about it is like a little too much yeah where it's like okay we like can, we need to break this down we need to critically analyze this a little bit more right and, and, and i think just you know that sort of discredits them I a little know, bit just but if you really see what the old school money is doing, they're going into Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You know, there's yeah. like ETFs that are being established that are Bitcoin based. Have you purchased any crypto or done any of that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I've, I've purchased crypto. I primarily use Coinbase, though. It's okay. one of those like I yeah, feel safest that, on there. That has like a good UI. Yeah, for it. yeah. it has a good UI. Yeah. I feel like relatively safe. Yeah. And I what have you purchased? What kind of coins? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, primarily Bitcoin and Ethereum. Okay. I was purchasing Litecoin for a little bit. Yeah. Um, kind of stopped on that. Um, oh, Never I, like Dogecoin. Or, I thought about Dogecoin, yeah. but when I wanted to buy it, but when it was like, you know, at the decimal points, yeah. it wasn't on Coinbase. And uh, I was like, okay. I don't want to go out of my way yeah, yeah. to try to buy it. Um, XRP. Okay. So They we'll just uh, got out of their case recently, did. right? So yeah. everybody was expecting it to jump after the case was finalized. Did it do anything or it no? It hasn't really done no. too much. Okay. Not like a huge jump, but yeah. um, I had already been thinking about it for some time. But yeah. we'll see. I just kind of toss my coins and don't expect to ever see anything for yeah. three generations. But here we go. <laughs> right. I mean, I just think even like just experimenting with the tech and yeah. knowing about it, you learn a lot of good like skills out of it, right? Yeah. So... I definitely always encourage people, everybody that yeah. when they hear crypto and I just start talking forever. So yeah, yeah. I know. do you ever <laughs> yeah. go to any of the Bitcoin meetups here in Oklahoma City? I don't know. Yeah. Have you been to any? I have. Yeah. I have. I've only been to a few. OK. I was actually genuinely surprised by them. I thought they were pretty informative and yeah. like a surprisingly diverse group of people. OK. Um, so that's also like part of what drew me to Oklahoma City, that mm-hmm. there's like such an emphasis on tech here and specifically like homegrown tech. Yeah. Um, and the fact that there's like these um, meetups where it's like different kinds of people with different kinds of ideas. Yeah. Are like, you in tune with like Techlahoma? Do you follow their yeah, stuff? I definitely, yeah. I definitely follow yeah. Techlahoma, especially because okay. I'm trying to do like the whole startup thing yeah. and networking. And yeah, I think it's a great resource. Awesome. Cool. So how do you think we sort of encourage people to get into sort of tech and science, right? Because I think traditionally they might be intimidated, yeah. right? Like, Maybe they, they might think it's too difficult or something like that. But I think once you get into it, I think it's just like anything else. Like you, right. you figure it out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And like I was also just like thinking the other day, like growing up and trying to learn what was going on, like how to figure out like grad school applications, figure out my classes or, you know, even learning like high school chemistry. Like YouTube wasn't as big mm-hmm. back then as it is now. And now with like chat GPT, it's like... It's, I don't want to say it's everything, but it can really be a huge game changer Definitely. specifically for people who like don't understand how systems work or like if you're the first person in your family to go to college and you don't like understand everything, chat GPT it because mm-hmm. it's going to give you like a wide variety of answers. Don't heavily rely on it. Of course, check your sources, right. all that good stuff, <laughs> but it's a huge game changer. Definitely. Yeah. So. Do you have a lot of friends that you can like talk to? tech with and talk that stuff because that's always my struggle yeah is like my friends are never like interested in talking about tech um so it depends on the friends yeah so i have a couple and then also like there's also the intersection with like just pure science friends Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i'll you know talk science with them 
but I'm also kind of like a little bit out of it since I, I don't, um, I'm not working in the lab anymore. You know, I don't conduct experiments. I don't do research okay. in that way. Um, you know, for my day job, I you yeah. know, just focus on more reading. So. so do you think going forward, your goal is to grow sort of the entrepreneur side or you think you're still going to keep sort of the science background as well and sort of like pursue both or what? Well, to me, I, I don't necessarily see them as separate because mm-hmm. it's like I'm constantly using the skills that I acquired, that I developed during, yeah. you know, scientific training. It's the data analysis. It's the critical thinking. It's the discernment of trying to determine what is a need and what isn't. So short answer is yes, entrepreneur, but still using all of that, you know, data analysis skills um, that I developed throughout the years. Cool. How do you sort of stay in tune with everything that's going on, right? Because everything changes day to day. Yeah. So how do you stay up to speed with what's going on in tech, what's going on with trends? Like if you're going to go that route, you're going to have to be in tune, like what's going on, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, a few things. So I do follow like a lot of science websites because that's mm-hmm. I have to do that for my day job. Mm-hmm. And I read, try to read the papers and stuff. But in terms of the tech side, um, like Techlahoma Slack is really useful. And then like just quickly like reading through resources. And I've also been using like ChatGPT a lot to kind of get like summary and key points and like figure out where else to read. Mm -hmm. TikTok is really helpful. But again, you have to be able to like critically analyze and discern like what is bogusness and what's not, right? So like if you hear something (laughs) on TikTok, Go check it out. You know, yeah. go double check it. Yeah, because everybody's a professional. <laughs> Everybody, right? Right. Everybody's a financial guru, right? <sighs> yeah, like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what do you have developed so far for your app? You know, you say you're, you're validating your model. Yeah. You know, you're, you sounds like you got a group. Maybe you're, you're forming a team. Like, what, do you, what are you sort of like doing at the moment? Yeah. So at the moment, we're creating a landing page. And okay. that's as far as we've gotten. So... Um, for anybody who is listening to this, who is curious about this problem, who um, has maybe been looking for something like this, I'm looking for people who are good at developing, who know algorithm development, who also like understand marketing and research. Yeah. And so these kinds of people that I'm looking for, keep in mind, we're a startup. So ideally you have a day job and this would be like a second sure. you know, after work thing. Because right now I don't have any funds. It's, yeah. it's startup funds, meaning I'm bootstrapping it. Cool. And so for the time being, um, just have the landing page. The live event was meant to collect data in person. Mm-hmm. But instead, since you know it kind of got postponed, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to have a survey that's actually out at Resident Head. And you can scan it. And okay. if you are chosen, uh, you'll get free tickets to show. So awesome. that's sort of the little perk. But cool. th- it's going to be a series of questions, sort of, you know, doing my, my data research yeah. and analysis. So everything I, I hear so far, there's like a physical component. You yes. have to go there to scan it. It's just not a link that you send right. out, right? Is right. that, oh, you're always going to have like a physical component? Is that what you're trying to do or what? I'm going to try. Yeah. But of course, like if getting me, you know, those um, X number of users that makes it more statistically significant. Yeah. If, I, if it's easier to send you the link, I'll do that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, ideally, I would like people to kind of go into these physical spots, scan, and you know, win yourself a, free, a pair of free tickets to show at Resident Head. Or mm-hmm. um, I haven't really thought about setting it up at other spots, but I, I guess I'm focused more so there because it's a bit of a younger crowd that goes there. You know, it's on the south side, which has historically been Latino. Yeah. And so. Cool. Well, how would you describe sort of your target audience for this app? Right? Yeah. Like, is there a certain demographic, age? Like, what? Who do you plan to target? Yeah. So, um, primarily, I'm targeting the Latin demographic. Mm-hmm. I want everybody in there. So, um, age though, I'm trying to aim for like 25 plus. Yeah. 30 plus, right? Okay. And sort of the cutoff for that, which I don't really know if there's really a cutoff for that, right? Would be probably 50. Okay. Um, for the dating component, right? Um, in terms of like networking and community, there's really not going to be a cutoff for that. But dating, that's going to be the, the target demographic. Got it. So you could and potentially be a member and just participate in the community aspect right. and not the dating. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so I am focusing on professionals and I am defining a professional as anybody who's working on themselves personally, uh, professionally, emotionally or just you know a lifelong learner anybody who considers themselves a lifelong learner that's who i want participating because those are going to be the kind of people who more than likely care about you know their day-to-day what's happening but also care about others around them and in the community and you know are going to be more likely to be more concerned about that yeah 
do you think you're going to introduce an educational component? Maybe some of these events are meant to educate, like you know, to your point, maybe like a Bitcoin thing yeah. or like, you know, crypto or whatever, just in general. You know, I actually yeah. haven't thought about that, but okay. I will you're put welcome. that in my back pocket. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, it's an opportunity, right? Yeah. If you're trying to build communities and maybe a great entry point for people that may be intimidated, right. that could be a little gateway to nice. like, hey, explore this that's option. That's a good idea. Right? Yeah, I will put that in my back pocket. Awesome, cool. <laughs> so you're the, the only guest that has come prepared, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? You've, you've came prepared, you've, you've brought a lot of bottles, but the one that I think is super interesting is this one right yes, here. So tell me a little bit why yeah. you chose this one. Yeah, so this is a tequila that is made by women, um, it has a woman founder, it's from Mexico, um, manufactured by women. So um, I just really wanted to focus on this tequila because it felt a little bit more, I mean, first of all, it's good tequila. Yeah. You can drink it straight or you can mix it if you'd okay. like, whatever your preference, no judgments here. Awesome. <laughs> but as well, um, you know, that's kind of where I want to be supporting and putting my money and my dollars. So yeah. these, you know, sort of women owned, Mexican owned tequilas. Yeah, that's super uh, sort of interesting and sort of like, another aspect that businesses have to be aware of nowadays yeah. is like what sort of like your overall like mission yeah, right what right. do you want to represent right mm -hmm. so like this could have been any tequila but it's like women founded it's right. like women based right so they have like a mission that's outside of just making good tequila right, right? exactly yeah so, yeah that cool. was my focus on that but yeah. very good tequila so. awesome and this other one <laughs> what about so, this other one this is just a personal favorite. Yeah. This is Tequila Honor by Kate Del Castillo. So if you okay. are a Kate Del Castillo fan, awesome. um, check this out. Unfortunately, you can only find this so far where I found it is in Texas. Really? San Antonio, yeah. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, lover, hater. I don't know. I love her. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you are a fan of celebrity tequilas, to this, in my opinion, would be the best one. Okay. Um, but cool. that's just my opinion. Awesome. And then this one. This and then is, the last one here was yeah. also super Mexican fancy. Owned. Yeah. yeah. Um, just another beautiful bottle. I It's just super smooth. Again, I've only found it in Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, with San Antonio, you're a little bit closer to the border. Sure. And so you get a, a little bit more variety of tequilas and all that good stuff. But awesome. um, yeah, very smooth, very good. Um, don't know the full story behind it, but I know that I like it. Cool. I think we're going to have to invite you back just to have some tequila <laughs> yeah, tasting. Yeah, we'll do a tequila right? tasting. Yeah, yeah that'd be amazing. Stock up from Texas. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Another thing I always ask is to tell me something about yourself that most people don't know about. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, so I always think about like sliding doors moments, right? Like different pathways you could have taken. Yeah. And so in high school, specifically when I was living in Vegas, um, my mom and my dad, surprisingly, I don't know, at the time they sort of were like concerned about my emotional well-being living, you know, living in Las Vegas. Oh, really? And yeah, because like I said, I was studying all the time. Mm -hmm. It was a really, really tough school. It's kind of notoriously known for not having the happiest students. I see. Um, but um, they encouraged me to like do modeling at the time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I almost did that, but I didn't do it because I was so focused on school and I didn't... Um, I didn't think it was sustainable I didn't, yeah. at the time. I was like, this isn't long term. Plus, I'm like five, whatever. This is not going to happen, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I can only do print model modeling. I'm so mm -hmm. short, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And so sort of like kind of that was a surrounding that was, you know, my sister and I um, at the time. She was, so my sister was like about 10 years older. She would always, I'd always go out with her. I'd always tag along with her, especially when we were in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And this one day, because she was trying to cheer me up, we went randomly to go have dinner at the Palms Casino. And so we found out that they were having, um, they were filming a movie there. Okay. And we happened to be extras in a movie. No way. That's awesome. <laughs> I had no business being yeah. there. I was like 16. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's. Uh, oh gosh, I can't remember. Oh, what happens in Vegas? That's what it was called. Okay. Fashion Kitchen and Cameron Diaz. If you blink, cool. you miss You'll me. Yeah. You miss me All if right. you blink. Okay. <laughs> awesome. That's very cool. Cool. We are getting the signal here that yeah. we're out of time, but before we sign off, go ahead, plug in your socials. Yes. Where can people find you? Landing page, anything you want to promote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So socials for Corazon Sazon. Um, Instagram is Corazon Sazon underscore OKC. Our TikTok, same thing, Corazon Sazon underscore OKC. Awesome. Um, our landing page will be CorazonSazon.com. We are hoping to have it ready to go in about two weeks. Okay. So, 
Cool. Thank you. Awesome. I want to thank you for being on the <laughs> podcast. I know you're super busy. Yeah. It was really cool to hear your story and hear what you've got planned. And and I'm glad we got to geek out about data, right? And crypto <laughs> yeah. and everything. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. awesome. All thank right. you so much. You're welcome. There you have it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the super talented Dr. Bianca Flores, Corazon Sazon on the Maverick Podcast. Keep grinding because in dreams we trust.